Hey guys, it's Mackenzie Deacons again, and today is gonna to be an awesome day because we're gonna go over the exposure triangle. I know, you're like, what the heck is the exposure triangle? But this is the piece, the piece to the puzzle of your first beginning journeys of photography. It's the tricky one, I know, but I'm gonna simplify it and make it super easy to understand, okay? So first of all, let's backtrack and start talking about the word exposure. As you can see in this picture right here, the picture on the very left is something called underexposed. The picture on the right is overexposed, so it's too bright. So you can see like the picture on the left is too dark, the picture on the right is too light, and the picture in the middle is just right. It's kind of like the three little bears. <laughs> but hey, so when you hear the word exposure or overexposed, underexposed, correctly exposed, that is just talking about how light or dark an image is. And so now we're going to talk about the exposure triangle. So how to create correct exposure by using three components. So there are three components to this exposure triangle. So three pieces that help you correctly expose an image or create a great looking image, right? So the first one I'm going to teach you and talk about is called ISO. I will be telling you these three things in an order of the way that I change them in my camera when I first start a session. So ISO um, is, I, I actually in my mind, I think of the word, or I think of the word sensitivity. So I take that S out and I remember that S as sensitivity. So it's similar to how film used to work in your camera. So there was something in, um, there was a sensitivity in film, and I don't know if you remember this, but when we used to go buy film at the store, uh, you would get like the 200 speed film for like a bright and sunny day. Like there was always like a sunshine on the on the package. Um, and then if you wanted, if there was, it was like a lower light scenario or something that was darker and you were shooting indoors, you would get uh, the 800 speed. Now, that's so that's similar to how film has translated into digital photography now. So in my mind, so I'm very visual. I'm an artist first, and then I have to learn all the tech shenanigans later. So in my mind, I envision a piece of film on the back of my camera. And then in my mind, so ISO, when I change my ISO, I am changing the sensitivity to that film and how that reacts to light. So for this one, it's super easy to remember the higher the number, the more sensitive your camera will be to light. So indoor settings, you want a higher number so that you can have that sensitivity work for you. Um, in outside situations, 200 is a great rule of thumb. So 200 is great to start out, out at. Now, ISO also has a little trick to it. If you go too high, you'll start to introduce that noise or some kind of pebbly ruddiness in the shadows. So you can see in this picture, on the very right, that is that eyeball you see is actually zoomed in on that bride's eye, the picture in the middle. So that's like in the shadows. Um, the reason I'm showing you this image is that picture was shot probably an hour and a half after the sun went down. So they were running too late in traffic and stuff, so they got to the beach at the time the sun set. So this entire session was shot after the sun went down. So in my mind, I just immediately started thinking, okay, I need to start with a higher ISO. So I'm gonna change that ISO to even starting at 800. Um, I was shooting with the Nikon D800 in this, in this uh, scenario, and it doesn't have the best low light, it doesn't have the best low light ratings, but not like the Z7, which is what this this is shot on. I love the Z7, I love the Z7. Okay, that's neither here nor there. Um, but yes, so starting out with a higher ISO, bigger number will give you that instantly brighter image. Okay, so that's, but that's not set. You don't keep changing that throughout the whole session. You take advantage, look at your scenario, realize like what type of light it is. Is it natural or not? Is it really bright? So light, out, um, outdoor light, very bright. You're gonna have a low ISO, but once that sun starts to go down, your quality of light also goes down. So then you start s slowly bringing it up a little bit more. Okay, so that's on that. So that is one of the things, and I, I call it a brick wall because, oh, that wily e. Coyote, he builds that brick wall. <laughs> he just is such a silly guy, he just runs right into it, right? <laughs> Anyway, so like I said, I'm very visual. So in my mind, each of these pieces to the exposure triangle have a limitation or like they smack into this brick wall, right? So uh, the ISO, this brick wall, is that it creates too much noise or that pebbliness in the shadows. 
Um, if you like that look, which is kind of happening right now, it's kind of equivalent to film grain, which is really cool. Love it. We can also add it later in, in Photoshop and Lightroom. But if you want to start out really high and kind of grab that into the shadows, then you can bring it up to like a crazy high um, ISO. Now, the newer the camera, the better the ISO ratings. So um, in the beginning, it was all about megapixels, right? Like, oh, how many megapixels is your camera? Now it's all about ISO and how great uh, your camera can operate in low light scenarios. So something to think about. So if you have a new camera, you can really trust that ISO and go up really high. If you have an older camera, you might need to um, kind of evaluate like the, the what's happening in your shadows to see what the quality of images you're getting there. Okay, the next piece to this exposure triangle is f-stop. And f-stop is my most favorite. It's my most, fa it's my most favorite because it creates something called shallow depth of field or bokeh or the blurriness in the background, the reason you bought your camera. Um, it's also like, well, actually portrait mode is pretty awesome right now, but it's like the professional version of portrait mode is aperture or f-stop. I'm only going to call it f-stop right now because I don't want to hurt your head too much, but um, aperture and f-stop are the basically the same thing, aperture. Anyway, so we'll talk about f-stop. Now, f-stop. You can see here, um, it, it does it does create that blurriness, that shallow of the field, but it also helps control exposure. Remember what we talked about? So exposure, how light or dark an image is. This, ex this is the second piece to the exposure triangle. So this picture or the, the aperture demonstration on the very left is an F2, which means it's a really big opening. And then the picture or the little diagram on the very right is F16, which means it has a small opening. So it's letting in less light. Here's how I visualize this. It's similar to how your pupil dilates and constricts when it needs more light or less light, when your eyes need more light or less light. So for example, if you are outside on a sunny day, your pupils are really small because they're not letting a lot of light in. But then you go into a movie per se, and it's really dark in there and your eyeballs are like, I can't see anything. And so it hurries and dilates. So it opens up so that it can bring in that light and understand that information. Same thing if you go out of the movie theater and you go out into the light and you're like, oh, the light. So your pupils constrict because they don't want all that light. Okay, so we're exp the f-stop is all about your pupil and how it opens and closes getting bigger and smaller. That helps control exposure. But like I said, f-stop also has a secret power. And that power is creating that blurriness, that shallow depth of field, that bokeh in the background of your photos, which is what we literally all want in life. And that's why we became photographers because we want to have that yummy, yummy blurry in the background. It is super easy to achieve when you have a good lens on your camera. So here comes the bad news. All of you uh, camera kits out there that got like those little, the, and it came with a bag and it came with a card and a, the body and two lenses and all these big things. So those lenses are really awful. And so you're gonna have to just like ditch them. Like they're, they're bad, they're awful. They won't let you open up your f-stop to create that blurriness, that, F, that shallow depth of field. You're go, going down to this diagram right here, your kit lenses, the camera kit lenses will only let you open up your f-stop to about f4, which yes, it might be able to help you achieve that blurriness in the background, but the easiest way is to get a lens that is either 1.8 or 1.4. And I only shoot with 1.4 lenses or my uh, other, I will talk about lenses in a minute, but my 1.4 lenses are my go-to lenses. They're the ones that create that yummy, yummy, gorgeous blurriness in the background. They're artistic, they're crisp, they're, oh, they just create just beautiful images. So this picture on the very left was shot at F 1.8 and you can see that it's blurry in the background. But for this situation, I was like, oh, well, I, what if we made it, you know, more crisp or, you know, so that the background, that little, th that thumb, that thumb sign was in focus. So I changed my f-stop to f9. So I was big and open and then I shut it down to f9. Now, if I only did that, if I only controlled that f-stop and shut it down and didn't change the other two pieces to the exposure triangle, that picture on the on the right would be completely dark because I'm bringing, I'm shutting it down so that it can be correctly, or so that the background can have that, um, that thumb sign can be in focus, but I'm also letting in less light. So that then I need to change one of the other two pieces to the exposure triangle, right? Uh, the reason you do, okay. Oh, we're going to talk about 
Okay, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. But next we're gonna talk about that 50 millimeter 1.8 lens. I like to call it the Nifty 50. And if you click on the link below, I am I have a link all set up for you. Uh, I prefer Sigma lenses because they're awesome, but I also shoot Nikon. So Nikon is also, <laughs> I love Nikon lenses. Canon is great too. Love Canon or Sony mirrorless. Love all of it, all of it's good. I have below the links to the 50 millimeter lens. This lens is awesome. It has a great price point. It's only like around $200. It's game changing. It's going to open up that f-stop to be able to go to f1.8. You'll let in all of this yummy light. It'll be yummy and crisp and you'll be able to shoot inside and get these gorgeous crisp images. Whereas like if you had that camera kit lens, you were only getting to f4. Okay. So now you're nice and big to 1.8. Okay. These cam, like I said, this lens is a great, the great lens to have. Um, one more thing, I love Sigma lenses because they are kind of similar to like Kirkland, the Kirkland brand, like from Costco. Like they, they're not like the that name brand, but you're not paying for the brand, you're paying for like that yummy quality. So Sigma lenses are awesome. They have an amazing price point. This specific lens, the 35 millimeter 1.4 is my most versatile, my go-to lens. And again, I have like that link below. So just click on that. It'll help me open up to a 1.4. Also, it's very versatile in that it's wider, so I don't have to like back up into like the corner of a room to try to get everything in my picture. So 35 is a little bit wider of a lens. Um, and it's crisp, it's yummy. I just love this lens. I seriously, if I go to Disneyland, if I go anywhere, this is the lens that I have on my camera no matter what. Um, okay, so these are my favorite lenses. I have the Nikon 70 to 200, that big fat lens. I would suggest as a beginning photographer to not jump into like the big, big lenses. Uh, I think you can achieve more but and not have to spend so much money um, without getting that big lens. Here's the truth. I bought that lens because I was like, I want people to take me seriously as a photographer. I need the biggest lens possible so people think I'm so awesome. Anyway, obviously that's incorrect and ridiculous, but it happened. That's true. Um, so don't worry about getting like a big giant lens. Make sure that you're purchasing the thing, the lens that's appropriate for what you want to shoot. So I'm a wedding and event photographer, the 24 to 70 2.8, you have to have it. I love it. Nikon has it. Sigma has it. Canon has it. It's basically like the all around versatile lens. It has a great aperture opening. So it lets in a lot of light. And then you can also zoom in or out, zoom forward and backwards. That 50 millimeter lens and that 35 millimeter lens that I just talked to you about, those don't have the option to zoom in or out. So the, they're called standard or fixed or prime lenses. Um, I just hope that I'm not hurting your head right now. <laughs> anyway, so instead of zooming in and out like this, you zoom in and out by walking forward and backwards. So yes, you know, it's kind of like an exercise, like you'll burn more calories by getting these standard lenses, but really like they just, you they go down that 1.4 and Oh, I just love them. Anyway, so those are, I'll have the links to all of those lenses down in my, uh, down in the bottom there. Um, okay, so let's just recap really quick. We've got the first piece of the exposure triangle is ISO. So the sensitivity on the back of the camera, it's kind of visualizing like the, the film on the back. Um, the next piece is f-stop and that is controlling how much light by a way of like opening up our aperture big or really small. Okay. And oh, and I forgot the tricky part to that one. So, so lame. Um, the bigger the opening, the smaller the number, the smaller the opening the bigger the number. So it's just backwards. So the way that you remember that is you're like, F, this numbers are not the right way. F, these numbers are wrong. So think of F stop. Like now why is my F not, oh, I forgot the bigger the number, the smaller the opening. So the less light. Okay. Final piece to this exposure triangle is shutter speed. And you can't really compare your shutter speed to like your eyelid opening because if we keep our eyes open, it doesn't like get brighter. So don't think of it that way. The shutter speed is basically like, pretend this is your shutter and your, and when you, your shutter release button, the picture taking button is the thing that fire that opens up your shutter to open and expose the picture and then close it. So if you have a fast shutter speed, it goes like this. Okay. Letting in not very much light, but if you have a slow shutter speed, it's like this. Okay. So the slower shutter speed is going to let in a lot of light. A faster shutter speed is going to let, let in not, not very much light. Okay. Now shutter speed also has 
a pretty cool secret power. Not as cool as the F-stop one, but the, it does have a special power. Um, it does help to control motion. So this one is probably what most beginning photographers have the hardest time with because they're like, I always have blurry images. And the reason is, is because the shutter button is the easiest, it is the most easiest thing to adjust in your camera. So when you are changing your shutter speed on your camera, it's the old, the scrolly thing. So it's just the scroll, <laughs> I call it the scrolly. It's fine, probably has a real word, it's fine. So the scrolly thing, so that's the easiest way. So when people are trying to get a, a brighter image and they're in a low light scenario, they're not changing the f-stop or the ISO, they're changing the shutter speed just to be crazy slow. So when they do that, not only is there, it, you know, if they're taking a picture of a kid, the kid's blurry because they're running or even your motion of holding the camera, you're creating that camera shake with your own self. So even if you're taking a picture of a banana on a counter, um, if you have too slow of shutter speed, you'll still have a blurry image because you're hold, hand holding that, that, um, camera. So, um, the rule of thumb here is one, two hundredth of a second. So like I said, with, um, uh, ISO 200 is a great, great uh, ISO rating there. And with shutter speed, same thing, one, one, and then it'll have a slash 200th of a second. So um, that one will help you stop motion. Again, if you're taking pictures of like a really fast kid, like you're running or, or you need to stop motion, you need a faster shutter speed, like that's gonna be your priority. So if you know that you're didn't go, you'll have to stop motion, that will be your priority number one, to have a fast shutter speed, and then you'll need to compensate for exposure with those other two elements. I'm hoping that this is under, you're making sense. You're, I'm hoping that you're making sense here. Okay, here's a little tutorial on how to change your ISO, your f-stop and your shutter speed on a Canon, a, can, a consumer cam, Canon level uh, model and a Nikon camera. To change your f-stop on the Nikon 5100, you hold this button down right here. It's a plus and minus button. And while you're holding it down with your index finger, you are scrolling with the scrolly where your thumb is. And that will adjust your f-stop for this Nikon 5100. To change your shutter speed on the Nikon 5100, you just scroll your thumb, use, your, use the scrolly with just your thumb, not holding anything down. And by doing that, you can, you can scroll and change the shutter speed, very easy. To change your ISO on the Nikon D5100, you press the shutter release button so that your menu pops up on your LCD screen, and then you see this eye right here. You just touch that eye, and that will pop you over into this menu over here. And you can change your white balance in this area, but the best part is you can change your ISO. So right here is your ISO. You just press OK, and then you can scroll down. So for um, you know, for your higher ISOs, if you have a low light situation, you can go all the way up to like the 5,000 range. You need to make sure that you're not introducing too much noise up in this area. That's, that's where you'll start to get some noise up in there. But my favorite is keeping it around 200, 100 to 200 is a great ISO rating to start out at. So easy peasy. Okay. To change your f-stop on the Canon T3i, Hold down this AV button right here, AV plus minus button, and with your index finger, scroll with the scrolly, and that will change your f-stop. That's an easy way to change your f-stop on this Canon camera. To change your shutter speed on this Canon Rebel T3i, just simply scroll with your index finger to change that shutter speed. To change your ISO on this Canon Rebel camera, you hold down this ISO button found on the top of the camera, and while holding it down, rotate or, or press the over button, the right and left button, to select your desired ISO speed. Okay, you guys, I hope that you thoroughly enjoyed your quick intro to the exposure triangle, ISO, f-stop, and shutter speed. Um, keep in, uh, Be sure to subscribe and like and comment. I would love to hear your thoughts on this video and how it went. Um, I will be posting more tutorials soon, so stay in touch, stick around. We're gonna have fun together. I love you so much, goodbye.